thank you, Dr. Ajaria. Welcome uh, to the Bankers Trust show. So uh, let me uh, let me go straight. Uh, uh, in your book, Quest for Restoring Financial Stability in India, you have said that uh, the Reserve Bank of India lost its governor on the altar of financial stability. But what about you? You too left uh, six months before your term coming to an end. Uh, along with Patel, you, you did put up a stiff fight. So isn't that you are also a victim? Uh, firstly, uh, thank you, Tamal. Uh, very happy to be interacting with you in this conversation. Uh, you have started the first ball of the test match with a bouncer. Uh, so let me try to dodge it, uh, even though I'm wearing a helmet. Uh, I, I think uh, what I want to stress uh, throughout the book and in the message I'm trying to send is that uh, it's not so much about the personalities, that there are deeper underlying forces at work. Uh, and we need institutional arrangements in place to guard against them. Uh, I do think that uh, the central bank was under pressure, uh, especially when the horizons of the government got short. Uh, the resistances were put up uh, to the extent that some of us were keen to avoid the very excesses that we were trying to clean up from occurring all over again. Uh, and that came at a personal cost uh, to, to many of us. I think uh, I think we really ought to focus on why is it that even after acknowledging that the problem is there, having okay. put in place the insolvency and bankruptcy code, that the system as a whole, instead of moving forward, uh, actually regressed uh, in terms of its policy making and the cleanup efforts. And I think, uh, you know, uh, individuals along the way, in my opinion, are not so important. My sense is that uh, many of us would do it all over again if we had to do it all over again, uh, because I think we were really putting in place the foundations of financial stability for India for, uh, for the next several years, if not uh, decades. Uh, and uh, we would, if we had a shot at it again, I think we would go about it uh, to preserve it all over again. So thanks. You, you actually admitted that you two were victim. You said some of us. Uh, no, I, <laughs> not, I don't. I, not I, the governor alone. No, I don't think okay. I said that. I think in my case, uh, what I would say, uh, Tamil, is that uh, I had in mind uh, certain things I wanted to accomplish as a central banker when I came to the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, I had my own diagnosis of what was ailing the Indian financial sector. My diagnosis yeah. has always been that it is not just the state of the banking sector, but it is also the state of the fiscal arithmetic, uh, which is playing a critical role uh, in these conditions that we face. Uh, at some point, I had to take a call on what is the best way that I can raise these messages to the right uh, platforms for discussion, for an open debate. Because clearly, if we have to, if we had to move ahead with financial stability, given the resistances we had put up, uh, and clearly, if you need institutional reform on the fiscal side, uh, it requires a significant public debate. Uh, that is not going to happen overnight. Uh, and so I had to ask myself the question, uh, given what the system needs, in my view, uh, what is the best role that I can play from where? Uh, and of course, I had to factor in my personal circumstances. Uh, okay. Dr. Acharya, yes, uh, I think uh, true to your words, you did raise debate um, pretty bold stuff you did say in your speeches, which uh, uh, actually the way the finance ministry bureau had reacted to it, I remember. Let's not get into all this. But tell me this trend of writing books by the Indian central bankers. Dr. Subarao has an autobiography, tell all kind of stuff. Uh, then Dr. Reddy, of course, is a different kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. RBI stint was a part of it. And then Dr. Rajan and you, people call you Poomans Rajan. Both of you have come out with this uh, uh, compilation of your uh, speeches during the RBI tenure. And then you embellished it with a new preface and introduction and all. So tell me, I mean, this trend of uh, writing after your uh, tenure 
on your tenure in different is it sort of giving vent to your frustrations which you could not do at rbi this is the this is the vehicle to tell the world or what is this no what did you write uh, i would not say it is a, uh, it is a way to vent your frustrations at all uh, I, i think most of us are uh, very reasonable people in the sense that we expect that there would be resistances uh to the uh, to what we were trying to accomplish uh, i think i say it in the book uh, the preface chapter that it's no very easy to be a gatekeeper of financial stability it's not easy anywhere in the world because the underlying pressures are relentless uh, and you know it it's a, it becomes a little bit of a function of the institutions at what level the fiscal pressures are and so on i think in my view what has changed over the last 2 3 decades is that uh, initially uh, you know india was uh, essentially a nationalized country uh, you know for all practical purposes even though government deficits were large they were getting funded through financial repression of our banks through extraordinarily high statutory liquidity ratios and all you know in a way it was very easy for rbi to guarantee financial stability because uh, you could just engage in financial repression and the private sector didn't own much assets in the first place what has yeah. changed since 1991 is that of course we have realized that that is not the what we want the economy to be Uh, that in order to get away from this hindu growth rate of 3% uh, we need a thriving uh, and a growth uh, pro- promoting uh, private sector uh, this private sector of course needs to raise financing of its own and for that therefore uh, through a series of important reforms government markets have been modernized we have a corporate bond market uh, out there uh and you know various uh, uh reforms have uh, restricted the direct participation that the reserve bank used to have in the monetization of the government deficits so what has happened is that over a period of time finance securing financial stability securing macroeconomic stability has required that we move away from how these things were in the past in fact dr reddy puts it masterfully he he refers to it in the uh, forward of the book as the government yes. the central bank and the public sector banks being this hindu undivided family in which yes. you didn't bother about keeping anyone's accounts that is not yes. we, we can't we can't be in that economy anymore we have an ambitious a growing private sector and we needed to be successful for generating stable long run growth i think some of the frictions over a period of time that are emerging is that the central bank in my view is ahead yeah. of the curve is ahead of mm-hmm. the rest of the system in terms of securing the foundations of financial stability the quality of markets etc that we need for the long run growth of the economy the governments and the bureaucracy continues to want to do what is actually suitable for a more nationalized economy of the past they are not yet embracing the migration to a market based economy as substantially and as fully as we would like so i think the governors in their members are continuing yeah. their work in my view beyond their terms i see my book okay. pretty much as one more attempt to raise in public debate what i think are important issues for india to secure for the long run it doesn't matter whether i'm in the term or outside of the term the issue, if the issues are okay. there they are relevant for india uh, they need to be raised in some way or the other fair enough thank you uh, radu ajay this is always a mystery to many of us so you came as a deputy governor in charge of monetary policy but from day one uh, you sort of you had a mission that is to clean up the system i mean you call it clean up the system or securing financial stability so was it your choice or was it like you came as a as a as a as a um, person in charge of uh, monetary policy but it, the mandate was given by the governor how did it happen because it's completely different thing typically um, rbi deputy governor in charge of uh, you know commercial banking or so called dbod um, this this gentleman or the person is supposed to handle this you in charge of monetary policy but focused on um, 
financial sector stability and uh, and um, uh, cleaning up banks balance sheet uh, i think it's a it's a good question and i have to say i was very fortunate to have a almost 100% meeting of the minds on these issues at the reserve bank of india when i reached there yeah. uh, this is actually in some sense my core expertise this is what my research is all about it's about what what conditions uh, does a financial sector need in order to provide healthy intermediation to the economy uh, i had already studied this issue in the context of public sector banks for india i have studied this issue extensively for how europe has responded so i think it was very natural for me to be the spokesperson i think to create that moment okay. of change Uh, get the system warmed up uh, towards what was required uh, i think governor patel had these issues on his minds as well perhaps in, right from the term uh, right from his term as a deputy governor uh, and so we went about uh, the issue uh, and you know i i really want to hear also signal uh, uh, dg uh, vishwanathan who played a very central role uh, he was really the pillar uh, of the foundations that we were trying to put in for financial stability uh, i think different governors have different styles some governors like a very silo based approach in which uh, one dg will only participate in discussions under in the portfolio that's under him or her uh, some other governors like to build a little bit more consensus across the deputy governors across platforms uh, i think in my case it was just that i had the expertise perhaps uh, i was willing to write and speak uh, and maybe the combination of these things uh, made it useful for me to be part of this overall quest for restoring financial stability as i call it thank you dr ajay uh, you may you may uh, you may feel it's a very stupid question but i just want to no, no, tamil no questions are stupid only answers are stupid <laughs> no. <so. laughs> okay <laughs> no no you say the say the central theme of the book is the fiscal dominance mm -hmm. and how it is destroying the financial sector stability but isn't it the worldwide phenomena fiscal dominance even the country where you are speaking from us or everywhere else in the developed market covid or no covid in is the story of uh, fiscal dominance i mean right from what we have seen at least in the past one decade uh, post lehman so what's so unique about india story tell me uh, i think uh, you are you are spot on uh, i think what uh, what that observation reveals is that when growth is rendered uh, slow Uh, all governments because i think governments all over the world have myopic horizons in my view they become more uh, short termist at certain uh, points of time yeah. they try to do the quick thing which is to get credit flowing uh, create a credit based consumption stimulus uh, uh, and for that they start leaning on the central bank to relax the rules now uh, the reason why these issues in my uh, in my opinion are more uh, important in india is because we are yet cleaning up the banking sector from the excesses of the past decade we have not yet completed that exercise as i said we were moving forward but then we regressed uh, in several steps uh, as a result of some of these pressures second many of these countries that we are talking about are actually safe havens Uh, they have institutional arrangements yeah. in place they have very large borrowing markets their currencies are internationalized uh, and therefore uh, during times of shocks they almost have an automatic stabilizer in their borrowing actually money floods their bond markets when uncertainty rises rather than it being a problem uh, we don't have uh, that luxury uh, we are not a safe haven Uh, and as a result the fact that our fiscal is stretched exposes us to potential sources of vulnerability uh, and therefore whenever growth slows down instead of there being some capacity in the fisc to accommodate or there being an automatic stabilizer from being a safe haven instead the pressure now starts spreading down the line to the banks and of course the central bank gets caught up in this Uh, uh in order to being forced to relax the bank regulation so i think financial stability was not yet secured 
uh, and our initial conditions now have the sort of shocks uh, that we are in the midst of right now. Thank you. So let's get into some some of the micro stuff that you raised in the book. Uh, it's uh, quite fascinating. You were not absolutely explicit, but you said how the MPC was always under pressure from the government. I mean, to err on the, like if the inflation focused uh, downward, it's actually going wrong. It's fine as long as you can cut the rate. And similarly, you said uh, almost in as many words that well, the managing the balance sheet of public sector banks were somehow Reserve Bank of India's responsibility to create a situation. So uh, allow them to, to book profits in the bond market and uh, delay their uh, booking losses again from the same bond market. Mm -hmm. So it's basically RBI has been used by government as an instrument to ensure government borrowing, uh, smooth government borrowing, cheap government borrowing, and also to ensure that the state-run banks are you know, their balance sheet protection. So yeah. would you like to tell us more, which you could not say in the book? It's uh, like no, a sort I, of appetizer. You didn't get into details. Right. No, I, I, I think to me, the details are not important. I think, uh, you know, uh, I think tomorrow it may happen in some other form. I think the reason why I gave these uh, five or six examples that I give is because I wanted to paint the picture that the pressure is very pervasive. It is not just that one aspect of central banking policy uh, is under pressure or not. I would highlight, though, that when the pressures are there on the monetary policy front, uh, it is a lot less easier uh, for those applying the pressure to get away with it, because now there is an institutional framework uh, under which uh, the MPC has to function. There is an explicit mandate. Uh, you know, there are written minutes and statements and uh, resolution that comes out justifying what the policies are. Some of the other areas uh, don't have this institutional fabric. Uh, they are not as organized uh, through what I like to call as, a, as mechanisms of democratic accountability. Why did you take the decision that you take? Explain to me. Why did you take this extraordinary regulatory forbearance? Why did you relax the accounting rules in the middle of the year? Why are some of these changes made? And I think uh, because the public sector banks are there, because the government is trying to keep the recap bill very down, they have a tendency to put pressure on very intrusive issues, such as how to account for mark-to-market -market gains or when to recognize losses. Uh, uh, you know, uh, in fact, I think this quarter end uh, thing that I mentioned is, 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 I think, one of the most glaring interventions, because why should the accounting for bank balance sheets change mid-year? Because you want to show particular kinds of numbers. These banks are publicly traded. I think we owe to respect the integrity of the markets, the interests of minority investors, that we account for uh, the bank balance sheets uh, in an earnest manner. Uh, and so I think some of these pressures are, uh, are really unfortunate. Uh, and I think uh, they, are, uh, they are really suitable only for an era in which everything was basically this Hindu undivided family, so to speak. So, talking about public sector banks, uh, you know, now um, since you left, uh, there's a move uh, for consolidation. A uh, number of banks have come down. Um, so what is your take on that? Do you think, is, is that enough or do you see uh, privatization as the next logical stuff? So I think consolidation banks? is definitely not enough in my view. Uh, the only reason why I have not been against consolidation is because there have been so many times when positions of MDs, EDs, board members have been empty actually unfilled for long periods of time on the public sector banks. And, you know, that can't be good. You can't have these uh, institutions which are effectively being rolled over through taxpayer money without having adequate uh, senior management in place. So uh, the numbers shrink if you consolidate. And I think that's, to me, the primary benefit of this. There are, of course, costs. Uh, sometimes you have merged uh, strong balance sheets with weaker balance sheets. I would have preferred if the weaker balance sheets were simply left to prompt corrective action or their business models were entirely changed 
to become like the equivalent of microfinance or small finance banks. Uh, but I think clearly this is not enough. Uh, I think uh, as we are in the midst of COVID and the losses are likely to rise, uh, we need to inject capital into these banks. Uh, it will have to come either through the government directly, but the headroom for that is limited. So we are going to have to divest the government stakes in these banks. Uh, some of the board members of RBI have also gone on record saying that the stakes should be allowed to go below the majority stakes. I would be fully in support of that. I think that some reprivatizations should be on the table. It might have to be uh, the relatively better banking institutions, in my view. And I okay. think the, the relatively less well-doing ones, I would really focus their business objectives very, very significantly. I think they have no business to do universal banking. They should really be serving the objectives of development and financial inclusion, in my view. You, you spoke about financial repression. And um, uh, on the one hand, we are talking about banking consolidation or doing consolidation. On the other hand, many of us believe that we should have more banks. We have both uh, small finance bank as well as full service banks license on tap. Do you think is that India should bite the bullet and allow the fit and proper corporate houses, corporations uh, to float banks? with proper checks and balances because they have the deep pockets and you have been emphasizing on the uh, need of capital. Uh, I, would, I would say no. Uh, I think what we experienced with the uh, IBC and you know, a little bit of the somersault uh, that happened on the progress of the IBC is, is that actually these entities are very, very powerful. They have the capacity to alter the rules of the game. Uh, and I think if you let them into banking, you magnify the conflict of interests that uh, are at the root cause of some of our banking issues uh, many fold in the process. I think those who are reluctant to let them in, I think they have exactly the right concerns. Uh, I think the better examples in my view are the examples of the microfinance institutions. I think some of them have done excellently uh, in their uh, goals of providing inclusion uh, and making money at the same time. So they've, they've kind of developed a profitable franchise. As you know, making a small loan at the grassroots requires not just underwriting quality, but also requires ability to collect. You have to create incentives for these borrowers to repay so that next time when they come, they want a larger loan, a longer maturity loan. Uh, all this requires a lot of expertise and you can't just derive that from being a corporate who has deep pockets. I think you need to start small. Then as these microfinance entities grow, they may now want access to deposit base. They may want to make perhaps larger loans to some of the entities they are lending to. And I think those should be brought into the banking fold in my view. Uh, one issue you did not mention, which I have always been hoping for, is that I think we should, we could potentially open up the Indian banking more to foreign banks. Right now okay. we have opened up, but the yeah. but uh, we we want them to meet the kind of rules and restrictions that we impose on domestic banks. But yeah. there we can't apply these that criterion because they have to bring in capital from outside. The question they are going to ask is, can I generate return on assets in India that I can generate in some other parts of the world? So if we want foreign capital to come in, we have to think carefully through how do we make banking in India attractive to foreign banks. Foreign banks do will bring in a lot of expertise in underwriting, fintech, uh, risk management practices, human capital, etc. Uh, I think that should also be on the table in my view. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, going back to fiscal dominance, um, uh, you did, uh, you actually said in as many words that you are you're not very fond of the idea of Reserve Bank of India being the debt manager of the government and ensuring the government borrowing, how big, however big it is. But this is a complete deviation from the Reserve Bank of India ethos. You were talking about Reddy, Dr. Reddy and subsequent governors. They always fought tooth and nail. They did not want to give up the, the debt 
debt management business of um, you know the assignment so you think rbi should not be the debt manager for the government uh, and what's the logic uh, like i have very mixed feelings on this what happens is that uh, i think when rbi is the debt manager it's unable to remove its focus from the prices of the government bonds uh, and then it remains not just an issue at the time of the auctions participation in the auctions sometimes calling up the banks to pick up uh, it also becomes it also starts getting into the liquidity management uh, framework uh, and indirectly therefore into the some of the functions which relate to monetary policy so i think there is it's very hard uh, for the senior management to maintain chinese walls inside their brains uh, and separate the role of just being a placement agency or auctioneer of the debt from someone who can also influence the prices of these bonds Uh, that is why i think that if the government were to take it seriously uh, put in place the uh, technology and the human capital infrastructure and find some ways of committing not to actually simply call up public sector banks and our large insurance companies to buy up the bonds uh, it could be that there are some benefits of moving the market away Uh, my sense is the reason why the past uh, governors or even at present uh, there isn't a preference for that is because they lack confidence uh, both in the human capital that may be attracted uh, from such a government agency uh, as okay. well as whether they will maintain adequate distance from public sector institutions in running of these auctions uh talking about rbi larger role i think india believes uh, you know the central bank being a full service bank uh, whether it's uh, housing finance uh, whether it's uh, nbfcs or uh, everything has been you know taken care of by rbi and we have seen in the past uh, in the past two years uh, failure at the multiple level so do you believe that uh, you know um, rbi um, has the right kind of bandwidth uh, to to remain as a full service bank or does it should it give up certain functions or should it reinvent itself and remain a full service bank uh, uh you know the emerging view after the global financial crisis on this has been that it's better for a central bank to be a full service uh, central bank and reinvent itself to to perform these functions Uh, take the example of uk where the supervision authority was separated and then there was not much coordination between the central bank as the lender of last resort and the supervision authority a lot of the seeds of global financial crisis in the united states were because of the highly fragmented regulatory structure over different financial institutions that was in place uh, i think having said that uh, i think there is definitely a need for first of all just more supervisors uh, i think those who come from outside are surprised at the relatively small strength of the rbi supervisory cadre relative to the needs of the country and the needs of the financial sector uh, there is also a need for much greater specialization in supervisory skills when i was at rbi uh, i i tried to put in place the need and the structure for a supervisory cadre before i left Uh, i think that is the need of the hour uh, but i think it is both the quantity and the quality of the supervision work i think we need more supervisors but we also need more specialized supervisor both with uh, exposure to markets exposure to how risks are managed uh, exposure to how to use uh, Uh, how to be ahead of the curve in terms of doing stress tests and so on so you need a lot of risk analytics uh, and data and models being used along with the traditional way that rbi has been supervising uh, in order to reinvent this function to that of what would be fitting for a modern day central bank i'll come to that one question on that but before that uh, a couple of micro questions you made a sort of sensational statement that even the best rated indian corporations do not repay bank debt on time i mean on what basis you are saying this is it because you had a close look at the acrylic data which the rbi's internal database 
And uh, you know, uh, we understand that even the credit rating agencies have been asking Reserve Bank of India to uh, to part with the data, share the data with the raters. But RBI is very conservative about that, and that's why probably one of the reasons which why the rating agencies have not been able to get a you know get the get what is wrong at the right time. Mm -hmm. So, do you think? Uh, I'm sure what you are saying is absolutely correct. I don't question your statement. But then, should this kind of data RBI instead of giving it to yourselves, should start sharing with the at least the rating agencies? How do others? Uh, what's the point in having the data? Yeah, I think my understanding is that there are some restrictions on supervisory data being shared uh, outside of the institution. I think it violates uh, certain parts of the RBI Act. I, I'm not a legal expert on this. Uh, yes. But I think that's my understanding. Uh, in my view, what needs to be done is that uh, a single day default needs to be required to be reported uh, by the securities regulator, at least for all the publicly listed companies. Uh, this is now required on uh, bonds and marketable debt. Single day default disclosure is still not required on bank loans. But I think it needs to be a single day disclosure. Uh, I think that would be the best way to get our corporates to pay on time, for banks to get the liquidity on time. Uh, and I think it is materially relevant information to minority investors, whether the firms they are investing in are able to manage their liquidity or not. Uh, I think the re there's a reason why debt has a fixed date at which a payment is due because that's supposed to discipline the borrower to do whatever it takes to make that payment on time. Otherwise, the creditor can actually start some process of collection. Um, uh, you know, on how do I know this? I know it from a variety of sources, but I would like to highlight that, uh, you know, one advantage of being a faculty member is that you have very loyal students who give you okay. uh, correct information uh, from being in the in the in the darkest corners of the financial markets, uh, and they they and they and they give you insights uh, without uh, uh, sort of facing any conflict. Uh, and you know, as you know, in India, guru is uh, always respected a lot. <laughs> so, so this is so, a uh, norm. These are not exception. This is the norm, right? Uh, even the best rated corporations not giving money on time. Is it is it an except? Are there exceptions or? Uh, I think I don't know it. I, I didn't do a full-fledged study to know at what percentage this is, but uh, one would not expect a high an investment grade company to be missing its payments. I think let's let's put it in a very stark, simple understanding of what an investment grade rating is supposed to be. In fact, any missing of payment is supposed to be a default. Okay, that yes. is what, in, in fact, why, why is the definition of default in insolvency and bankruptcy code as just missing of payments? Even IBC says that missing of any payment is a default. IBC sure. can, be, can be triggered. I, the law itself allows a creditor to trigger the IBC if any default has happened on a promised payment. I think that shows yeah. that the legal basis of a debt contract is that once you have been given a time and an amount to pay, that is the time the payment has to be made. Otherwise, it's default. And that's materially relevant information, in my view, to all the other stakeholders in the system. So a public credit registry would solve the problem rather than Krillic being shared with uh, rating okay. agencies if there are legal hurdles. I think we could have a public credit registry where this information is gathered uh, and that could be shared with the banks. In the book, in your book, you pitched for the AQR, Asset Quality Review, uh, which uh, you did for the banks in 2015 for the NBFCs as well. And um, popular belief is this, if you indeed do this for NBFCs, many of them will be in trouble. So do you see uh, NBFCs as relevant in Indian market? They are playing a very critical role or you are not happy the way they have been they have been doing and many of them or few of them uh, you should allow them to die uh, post AQR. 
Uh, I think uh, invariably when a system has gone bust, uh, you know, they got flooded with uh, the search for yield investors who were putting money into debt liquid funds uh, after yeah. demonetization and the underwriting standards went for a toss. Uh, there was a lot of evergreening of especially housing loans, but maybe a lot simply got siphoned off in some way or the other. Uh, uh, so I think when you know that there are entities that might be in trouble, uh, I think the right thing to do is to at least uh, gather that intelligence. Uh, in my opinion, the stress tests, asset quality reviews are necessary to figure out how much capital you need to ask which balance sheet to hold. Uh, and once you know that uh, lending excess has happened in a certain part of the financial sector, the sooner you do it, the better health it can be in down the line when you need to uh, promote growth again in the economy. So uh, I think we have given it enough time. It has been stabilized directly or indirectly through liquidity injections, through lending by banks. Uh, I think at some point we have to actually ensure that it is fulfilling the intermediation function for which it is present. I would not be averse to some NBFCs going down the route of IBC as has been arranged, because that is the contract. I think they are not banks. They are not being asked to meet certain requirements. Uh, and that's because uh, they are supposed to be resolved through market mechanisms for the most part. Well, we are almost coming to the end. Two more questions, that's it. I know uh, the perception is, there's a wide perception is that Reserve Bank of, and you also hinted at it in a different way, in extremely weak when it comes to supervision. You know, if you see in the past two years, there have been frauds, there have been misappropriation and everything in private sector banks, public sector banks, NBFCs, housing finance companies, cooperative banks and all. And because RBI is a weak regulator, it focuses on, it wants to demonstrate its strength as a, as a sorry, weak supervisor, it, it wants to be a very strong uh, regulator and the problem comes from there. You know, all sorts of regulations is imposed on banks uh, to actually you know, cover up its, its own uh, lack of ability to supervise them. Uh, and in the process, the economy is suffering. Do you agree uh, with that? I think that's certainly one of the views. Uh, my diagnosis has been that RBI's massive failures have happened actually mm -hmm. through uh, supply push on credit, uh, you know, which I think the governments wanted uh, either explicitly or indirectly uh, through the public sector banks. Uh, I think uh, every regulator gets some uh, supervisory functions wrong at different points of time. Uh, but I think I would take the criticism on face value. If I was at RBI, I would introspect. I would try to reinvent the quality of supervision uh, and try to make regulation as principles based as possible rather than it have the flavor of micromanagement. I think RBI is steadily trying to move in that direction in markets. We did a very big push to make it more and more principles based. I think there is no reason why bank regulation also can't go in that direction. Thanks, Senator uh, Jaria. Uh, my last question to you is a, is a very rude question. Is this a uh, person like you <laughs> and a few others, uh, even though, I mean, off late, you know, the, the, the perception is this, that you are imported central bankers right, with your um, with your, you know, you don't give up your job. You come on lien, and you always know that you can come back with your uh, very respectable, prestigious, and paying job. And you actually don't uh, have a, you know, feel the pulse of Indian economy and Indian banking and finance. I mean, you see it through a through a different lens because you don't have a skin in the game, mm -hmm. and that's where the problem comes. How do you react uh, yeah, so some of it is just labeling us as sort of foreign trained and all that. And, you know, I, 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 I have nothing to say on that. As you know, my favorite song is Kuch to Log Kahenge Logo Ka Kaam Hai Kena. You know, you can't be bothered about that. Uh, I think the, uh, the second question you raised is a good one, uh, which is, uh, do we have enough skin in the game? Do we know the system enough? Note that we are not the only ones at RBI. It's not like 
these entities are uh, these individuals who come back are the entire RBI. There's a lot of other people. Uh, I think the value that we bring is precisely because I think we are not trying to necessarily build long-term careers at RBI. That gives us a certain level of independence in our thinking. Uh, we are happy to call the shots uh, when they need to be called. Uh, it's not that we don't study India. We study India on a regular basis. It's not like we don't have India inside us. I've always felt there is more India inside me than there is outside. Uh, I'm that close to India emotionally, in my view. Uh, and lastly, I would say we bring certain skill sets from having observed how things work in different parts of the world, which is valuable for India to learn from. I'm not saying Indian setting doesn't require its own policies, but there is no harm in learning from the good practices of other countries. And I think we bring those to the table. I think we need a healthy mix of foreign trained and domestic trained economists. To me, it's irrelevant where you reside. I think the question is, are you the right person for the job? Thank you. Uh, last question, last question, seriously last question, very personal one. Uh, I saw that your book royalty will all go towards Pratham India, every child in school and learning well, and Pratham USA. So is it because of the COVID, uh, that's why you have taken a call that the entire proceed should go uh, for this organization? What was that? If it's not too personal, if you can tell me, why is uh, this? No, actually, I'm very glad, uh, Tamil, that uh, you've actually uh, figured this out and I'm very happy uh, to be doing it. Uh, see, I, I, I'm very deeply committed uh, to the cause of promoting education for underprivileged children in India. I think it is what India's future is. I think it is the brightness of the youth and the minds uh, that they have. Uh, I think it may be one of the biggest uh, strengths of the economy if we can actually deliver on this on a sustained basis. Uh, because if you have the right minds, they will figure out the right things to do over a period of time. Uh, I've been very closely associated with uh, uh, Pratham, uh, which is, I think, an excellent run uh, NGO in India, it does large scale replicable uh, uh, promotion of education and literacy in India uh, since uh, now close to 25 years. And I've had the fortune of being connected with it uh, at least uh, since close to 20 years now. Uh, during COVID, it is my view that for the right reasons, of course, the focus is on uh, health, focus is on uh, stimulating the economy, the focus is on supporting those who might default, etc. But I think we also need to ensure that children are able to learn well if they can't go to school. Is digital content being provided to them? If they can't go to school, uh, do they have access to their teachers in some form or the other? And Pratham has been doing excellent work uh, in responding to the COVID on the fly. It already had a lot of digital content that has been shared with over 14 states uh, all over the country, including other NGOs. Uh, it has been using all kinds of uh, dissemination mechanisms, including the good old radio, because there are parts of the country where you can't send things digitally because there are no iPads or computers or laptops. So I think that we need to ensure as we fight other battles that some of the very long run investments that India needs, one of which in my view is in education, uh, are not sidelined. So, uh, you know, the fact that I'm uh, contributing my part of the royalties to Pratham is just a small way of uh, contributing and supporting their cause. Uh, I hope that those who are listening to this, uh, even if they are committed to other charities, find some space in their budgets to support uh, Pratham or other education NGOs that are out there. Uh, because I think the minds of our youth are the future of the country, in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Acharya. It's wonderful to, to, to hear uh, this. And um, for every reason... Uh, uh, your book should do well. Uh, thank you, Tamil, thank for you. the interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.